All right. Uh, welcome everyone to Dig4, our, our session that we're doing today. It's our fourth episode today. I would like to thank uh, Andrew Rathbun uh, to join us today. Uh, again, we're having a little discussion about how uh, the digital forensic community has grown and how it's evolved over the past several years. Uh, Andrew, again, thank you for taking the time out of your day to join us. Um, I'll pass it over to you to do a little bit of an introduction about yourself. Sure. Thank you for having me. Appreciate it. Uh, my name is Andrew Rathbun. Uh, most of you probably know me as uh, the administrator of the Digital Forensics Discord server. Uh, I have my hand in a couple other couple other uh, cookie jars around the community. Um, do a lot of stuff on GitHub. I contribute to about DFIR. Uh, I currently work at Kroll as an instant response uh, consultant. Um, <clears throat> been there for about three and a half years or so. Uh, prior to that, I was at HHS OIG as a civilian forensic examiner. Uh, I was there for about a year. And prior to that, I was local law enforcement at Michigan State University Police Department for seven years. Four years of that, I was on patrol. Last three years, I was on as a digital forensics detective. Um, prior to that, I was in the United States Marine Corps, and I was an infantryman. I went over to Fallujah back in 2006, 2007. So nice. it's kind of my, kind of my life story in a nutshell. Thank you for your service. So an interesting note, we actually have never actually met in person. Um, we, That's true. We've talked and chatted over over various methods for, yeah. I'd say, at least probably six, what, six seven years, years now or so. Yeah. Um, and we missed our last opportunity to meet in person in Austin a couple, well, back yep. in August for the, the um, Sands Summer. Yep. And About six weeks ago, give or take. And it's uh, we missed each other. So I'm like, hey. Uh, timing. Um, interesting enough, um, we my, one of my first papers that I actually, little white paper that I wrote, uh, Andrew helped me out uh, about. It's about how to uh, push a manual customer recovery to oh, phone yeah. an S6. And I think that one's still floating around on Discord. Um, I actually have sent it to a couple of people. or something. Yeah, it's a, the, the, the twerp for an S6. It was, uh, yep. There's some mistakes that I made along the way. I remember I misspelled, misspelled your name in that as well. Sure. So it was great. Hey, you and only everyone else since kindergarten. It's fine. Yes. So, um, <laughs> hey, Kevin, nice to see you. We have people uh, join in the hey, chat. Uh, you're not seeing that, uh, Andrew, but uh, Kevin says I do hi. have it up on other monitor. Gotcha. So, um, so your current role, uh, your work, uh, what do you do? What do you, uh, what do, you do on a day-to-day day-to-day uh, job? Uh, mostly ransomware cases is most of what we deal with at uh, Crow, or, or at least the team that I'm on. Um, I'm on. Uh, I'm actually on Team Canada, so I usually deal with a lot of uh, Canadian clients. Um, but yeah, you know, a breach happens and, uh, you know, they report to a law firm. A law firm then says, hey, let's use Crow. And then, you know, if it's a Canadian client, then typically it comes to our team. And it's just a matter of figuring out what happened. Um, it kind of the way I like to equate it for the non-technical folks is think of it as like a like a hundred car pile up on a highway, um, and then you're the responding officer. Figure out what happened, what the damage was. In this in this instance, you know what was taken. Um, just kind of like the bad the battle damage assessment, as we call it in the military. What happened? When did it happen? And the client wants to know how can we avoid this in the future. So, and then of course they have different obligations with, okay, if you know a hundred thousand. Um, people's social security numbers were taken, you know, we got to now notify them. So a lot of our forensics will drive some of those uh, decisions that the lawyers have to make. Super interesting. Even internally, we've kind of talked about this, like even in my own team, like I'm glad that people take care of that and do that because for me, that's like way outside my scope. So I'm like, I'll stick to phones and computers, but like the <laughs> IR stuff, I'm like, it's, um, it's nice to see that, you know, other people can handle this. Um, so how did you get into forensics? What, uh, because you, you you have a, a vast background, kind of similar to mine actually. Because I do I did come from military and then policing and then kind of ended up in tech. So how did you end up in forensics? What what drew you to that? Uh, so I was always kind of techy. Um, and when I was on my four years of patrol, I was kind of identified as like the I work night shift, so six p.m. to six a.m. Uh, of course, you know the IT staff is gone at that time. So whenever someone had a problem with something on their you know mobile terminal, they'd come and reach out to me. I'd usually fix it. Um, and if I could not escalate to IT, so rinse and repeat that for four years. And then, you know, once an opportunity came up for, hey, we need a digital forensic detective, I was the first one they thought of. And they're like, hey, you're doing this in January 2016. Like, all right. <laughs> so, yep, I did it. And uh, yeah, that's kind of how it worked. So it, it kind of goes to show you're kind of auditioning for something 
every single day of your life by how you put yourself out there uh, because people will make an assessment of you for what you're doing every single day. So when something comes up that fits you perfectly, boom, we need Andrew for that. So could you have ever imagined it would have gone to this point, right? Rewind back to 2016 when you did this, oh, right? No, nope. my, my degrees are in criminal justice, sociology, and human resources administration. Nothing to do with computer science, tech, forensics, cybersecurity, nothing like that. I was planning to be a chief of the police department someday, but completely different path I'm on now. So, and obviously I'm totally okay with that. It's interesting. Cause like, even for me, it's like, it started as a hobby and that turned into a career path. Um, mm -hmm. It's, it's, you know, you, you can't really predict, predict where you're going to end up, but I mean, some of the, the, the choices yep. and kind of how things evolve, you just, it, it works out. Yep. So, um, since we haven't really met, uh, we communicated often in virtual channels. Um, mm -hmm. Let's little, do a little dive into history about this. So what? So for those that don't know, Andrew was one of the, the people that started the Digital Forensic Discord channel. Um, the joining links, if you aren't aware uh, or aren't part of that, is uh, it's in the video description. So what led you to actually start this? Kind of why did you go down to that, uh, that path? Uh, so I think you and I probably met on like the Google group, or I, I think that's where the IRC channel started from. Uh, it was a mobile forensics uh, channel on IRC on Freenode. And so it was you, me, and like 10 other people, give or take. Um, so we're talking back and forth there. You know, I was a detective at the time. You were a detective at the time. All the others were detectives, all doing our mobile forensic things. And, you know, back in the Android 4 days, probably 5, 3, you know, somewhere around that area, I don't know what version of iOS because I'm an Android guy, but trying to use all these, you know, flasher boxes and ways to get into these uh, phones. So I think what spawned us needing to move to Discord was actually prior to all this, I had joined Discord just because it was kind of a new thing. Oh, what is this? Okay, joining some servers. Okay, that's cool. So we're talking on IRC for a few months and I need to post a picture of a phone. I'm trying to like convey a message to you guys and it would be best in a picture. I'm like, man, IRC's, it's fine. It's text-based. You know, there's no rich features to post a picture, embed a picture, anything like that. So I had to like basically take a phone or take a picture of like evidence, my evidence phone, upload it to like Imgur, paste the, paste the link. And I'm like, we got it. We need some, we need something better for this. So I'm like, Hey, let's do discord because that's a thing I've kind of been using the last few months. I really like it. Um, it's got a bunch of quality life features that we're lacking on IRC. So that's kind of how it came out. And it actually was the mobile forensics discord server for a while until we started getting more requests, more people that were non-mobile forensics focused. And uh, so we changed it to digital forensics discord server and the rest is history. So since discord is primarily used for gaming and kind of within that, that side of the community, is that uh, play video games? It was, sorry, what was the question? Do you play video games as well? Is that I, kind of as weird? Much as much as I can, yes, okay. yes, and actually, they've they've changed the messaging, the the branding. You know, I think it was like a year or two ago. They're like, "Hey, we're not just for games. We're trying to be just for everyone." So, well, um, it, it, you definitely captured that. I think uh, what the community has grown to today um, is definitely kind of showcases that that it does it. It's a lot more than just games. Absolutely. So, mm -hmm. who can join the Discord? Technically, anybody. Um, anyone can join. It's a public server it's you know you can just google digital forensics discord server and it's more than likely going to be a post that i've put on one forum or another be it reddit forensic focus etc of hey here's the link you should join this so, um re really anyone can um the only requirement really is you have to go in there and post in the role assignment channel say hey i work for the private sector hey i'm if you're law enforcement tell me what country you are because we do have we have it separated by country because when you're chatting with people it would be nice to know if you know, a cop somewhere is asking people a question and you can see they're from Sweden or you can see they're from whatever country, because obviously there's different laws in every country. So that's the only reason why we break it down. Law enforcement, USA, law enforcement, Canada, et cetera. I think we have about I think it was about 75, at least 75 countries. So if you think about it. I don't know how many countries there are in the world. I think it's around 180, but we've got about 75 of them represented, which is amazing, including Iraq, believe it or not. The what's the total count for user wise? I think we're we're over twelve thousand, just over twelve thousand. That's incredible. Because again, is yeah. this community? It's still it's global, right? Whether you're yeah. in Canada or in Australia, New Zealand, every, everyone's facing similar challenges. 
um, it's it's probably a, a fan, well, it is a fantastic way for users to connect and kind of bounced ideas back and forth. Uh, I just kind of quickly shared some of the, uh, actually, I'll back up. Um, different channels, there are so many different channels, whether it's some of the uh, training, programming, reverse engineering, cloud forensics, even the uh, off-duty one, there is a lot in there. Um, when, yes. when events are running, like uh, we have our capture the flag that's about to start very soon, uh, there's their, their own channel. Um, again, there's different vendors in here. You can pretty much reach out to almost anyone and kind of get a response for them fairly quickly. Um, so it's actually really nice to, and then even inter, interact with the community as well, because I've actually met a lot of people through here uh, that actually spawned a lot of discussions afterwards and then in person as well. So, yep, and uh, real, real quick, I'll, I'll share one uh, story too. One, probably one of the coolest stories that I've heard is it was a cop in Alaska and he's like, the nearest agency to me is like three hours away and I'm a, I'm a one-man shop. Uh, the server has been a life changer for me because if I need any help, it's a three-hour drive through, you know, the treacherous weather just to get, you know, some help. So I know there's multiple other stories like that, but it's it's been a game changer for a lot of people, myself included. So Definitely. And I, th I think the, the Forensic Forecast Awards do speak for themselves. You uh, did win, uh, the, the server did win, I know, this year as well. So yep. um, I know the community definitely uh, appreciates this. So um, Discord is not only, it's not the only project you're kind of working on. Uh, can you tell us about some of the other stuff you're working on? Uh, and I'll start with, um, how about CAPE, uh, for those that aren't familiar with it. Yep. So CAPE is a triage tool that you can use for uh, Windows forensics uh, created by Eric Zimmerman. Um, I work at Kroll. So uh, CAPE is our is our tool. Eric works at Kroll, of course. Um, so it's a tool that kind of automates all of his uh, easy tools and really any other command line tool. Uh, that you want um, the targets and modules that cape uses is open source it's on github so that's kind of a one of the projects that i i help out a lot with including a couple of other, his other easy tools including some tools i write myself and some scripts that i put together and just it's a lot of fun github's a lot of fun uh, i just want to say it's one of those skills that i think a lot of people you don't need to know how to code but you should really understand how github works the basics of git um, there's, I could, I could talk about this for a while, but I'd strongly recommend if, if you are interested in learning GitHub, but you don't know how to code, but you still want to contribute. There's a, there's a channel to talk about on, talk about that stuff on the digital forensics discord server called open source defer projects. Um, that's an, an essential skill. Git's not going away. So many things are on in cybersecurity and digital forensics are on GitHub. You need to know how to interact with it and maybe even contribute to it. So GitHub is a nice little transition to my next part. Um, you also run <laughs> something called the Defer Artifact Museum. Um, yes. It's, yep. uh, again, it's on uh, on uh, GitHub as well. Uh, do you want to explain a little bit what this is and what you're trying to accomplish here with us? Yeah. Um, so one thing I found is, you know, as time goes on, the past kind of gets forgotten about or it's harder to um, revisit the past, right? Unless someone is actively preserving it. So as we have so many operating systems that come and go, think Windows Phone, think BlackBerry, um, it would be nice to have those artifacts sitting around. Uh, so if you ever did need to reference it, it's there. So I fleshed out a lot of the Windows section because I do Windows forensics for a living and that's kind of, kind of my bread and butter. Um, really could use more help on iOS, Android, um, Linux, I know it's just logs, but just being able to have, you know, a, a sample log of whatever's on Linux right there for people to be able to look at, get familiar with. It's more of a, a repo to just have accessibility to artifacts. If, hey, I want to make a parser for whatever artifact, boom, there's sample artifacts right here. Or, hey, I just want to see what are the common artifacts on Linux or on Android 8, Android 11, compare that. You know, in the Android folder, for instance, I compared the amount of SQLite databases between 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 based off Josh Hickman's images. So just to be able to look at the progression of the amount of SQLite databases that are on those images, I think it goes from like 800 to like now 2,500 in Android 12. So it's just kind of a way to chronicle passively how artifacts change over time and just to be able to give people sample data to, uh, re to, to make tools with or just validate, you know, your smoking gun evidence is an sms.db for android 12 let's go look at a different one and just validate what i'm seeing you know test my query that sort of thing a lot lot of endless possibilities with it i think which we were going through this uh, i think it was last weekend that uh, i know ian was looking for a specific phone that he was trying to an ios version of ios 8. 
where do you try to find a an iPhone or an iOS device running iOS 8? It makes mm -hmm. it very challenging. Um, so for those that are listening, uh, yeah. contrib uh, any contributions are helpful. Uh, I know I, I chatted with Andrew about this, and we are kind of trying to figure out how we can best kind of provide some of the information to you, uh, mm -hmm. or at least to to contribute to this as well. Because again, it's it's the community effort as part of that. And you do see that Kevin's name got uh, was on that list as well. Josh's again, big community effort as well. Again, yep. I think the whole the whole premise of this uh, is it's a community effort. Um, one thing as well, I know that uh, you started writing a book, at least a portion of that. You want to talk <laughs> about that a little bit? Sure. Yeah, that's uh, you're referring to the Hitchhiker's Guide to DFIR. Um, yeah, which did win a Forensic Forecast Award this year. Um, so it was a idea that just kind of came to my head. I'm like, Hey, I really like using GitHub. Hey, I'm kind of interested in getting into self publishing of books. Why don't you combine the ideas? And, you know, at the time I didn't really have an idea for writing for enough material for an entire book myself. So I'm like, okay, why don't we, uh, you know, see if there's anyone else who wants to contribute a chapter or two and rinse, repeat that. till you got, you know, 15, 20 chapters and Hey, now you got, all of a sudden you got a complete book. So, um, I think right now we have about 14 ish chapters and maybe one or two off on that. Uh, we're looking to hopefully get to 20, um, but really, if anyone is watching this and has ever wanted to maybe write a book someday or publish something, but just doesn't have enough material, but you can write a little bit more about something than a blog post, get with me and you got a chapter. We got probably six spots left. Uh, once we get to 20, we'll probably put a cap on it, um, actually get a physical product out because right now it's digital only, PDF and EPUB. Uh, but you know, hey, you can have your have a chapter uh, writing credit to your name. So it's a, awesome. it's a pretty cool project. So everyone's written about a completely different thing. It doesn't have it doesn't. We don't have a plot in this book, right? <laughs> every every uh, chapter is independent of the others. So it's been a really cool for me to watch unfold, and hopefully for the authors, the other authors, it's been a, a cool experience for them. That's awesome. I know it's still on my to-do list. I, I still have that that pen. I know we kind of talked about this earlier. I'm like, I'm like, there's when I when I get some time, I'll I'll, I'll try to put something together because I know I, I still sure. always wanted to put something in. Um, I know you're based in Detroit, and we always talk about hockey, or at least in the you're at least a Detroit fan. Um, yes. So, yep. what's your outlook on this year's uh, hockey season? It's just about to start around the corner, so. Um, I'm hoping the Red Wings can at least uh, hopefully beat your Senators uh, and for a wild card spot. But, you know, hopefully come late March, we're still playing meaningful hockey. I think if that's whether we make the playoffs or not, that'll at least be forward progress on our part. But we had a big off season. We'll see how it all comes together on paper. I'm excited. Hopefully yeah. it doesn't all fall apart and hopefully our top two lines don't all get injured <laughs> early on. <laughs> you guys grabbed a brinket from us, so we'll see how that goes. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm excited for that. We need 40 from them. We thought we thought we were going to get the same thing, but <laughs> um, so I pulled some numbers. It's actually kind of interesting from 21. So the COVID year of uh, of NHL all the yep. way from the last year. So in 22, 23, so our last season, Ottawa had 86 points. Detroit had 80. Uh, but in 2021, we were at 51 and 48 points. So over Ooh. the span of two or three seasons, went up 66 and 68 percent. So that's some uh, upward oh. trends and hopefully uh, yeah. break that 100 yeah. mark and kind of make it into the playoffs. Yep. I think it'll be uh, you, me, and uh, Buffalo Sabres, I think will be kind of the three teams that are probably fighting for the same wild card spot. So oh, Josh says go Caps. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I want, I want Ovi to get the break that record. Yeah. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah. That'll be cool to see. <laughs> well, um, Andrew, thank you very much for taking the time again. Uh, and everyone that joined just watching. Uh, commenting hi heather uh, hope you guys are enjoying uh, hdcia um, but again thank you for joining thank you for chatting uh, so the projects that uh, andrew's working on the link for discord is in the description so if you ha aren't part of this join if you uh, haven't seen the d for artifact museum take a look at that if you can contribute contribute what you can if you want to write a chapter in the in the hitchhiker guide open doors to that as well. Uh, again, Andrew, thank you very much. And I, I promise at some point we will meet in person. Uh, It'll so happen. We just, we just have to plan this a little better. So <laughs> so again, for those, um, uh, again, keep in mind is that some stuff you're looking for is not gonna be always on the surface. Sometimes you have to dig. Thank you again and uh, see you in, uh, next month. Sounds good. Thank you for having me.